Coming up on Market to Market, presidential candidates exchange jabs on the economy in the first of three debates. And Midwest business conditions improve modestly, but the outlook is anything but optimistic. Those stories and market analysis with Sue Martin, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by DuPont Pioneer, working with growers to match the right product to the right acre. Science with service, delivering success. This is the Friday, October 5 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. A surge in hiring last month pushed the national unemployment rate below 8% for the first time in three and a half years. But the silver lining was not without a cloud. According to the Labor Department, U.S. employers added 114,000 positions to their payrolls in September. It also revised previously released data from July and August, adding an additional 86,000 jobs than it had initially estimated. Unemployment fell three-tenths of a point to 7.8 percent, the same rate it was when President Obama took office in January of 2009. In the months after the inauguration, unemployment rose sharply and exceeded 8 percent for 43 consecutive months. But many of the jobs added last month were not full-time. The number of part-time workers unable to find full-time employment rose in September to 8.6 million. That's the most in 42 months. Wall Street had a mixed response to the labor report as the Dow settled slightly higher on Friday while the S&P 500 and NASDAQ each posted modest losses. With the November elections looming on the horizon, President Obama and challenger Mitt Romney both seized elements of Friday's labor report to make political hay. Earlier in the week, each candidate blasted his opponent's fiscal policies and explained how he would get America back to work. President Obama and Governor Romney. In the first of three debates, President Barack Obama and Republican challenger Mitt Romney went toe-to-toe over domestic policy issues Wednesday in front of an American television audience estimated at nearly 70 million viewers. In a wide-open format structured within six 15-minute segments, Romney and President Obama began with a litany of economic bullet points. I'm not looking to cut massive taxes and to reduce the, the revenues going to the government. My my number one principle is there'll be no tax cut that adds to the deficit. I want to underline that. No tax cut that adds to the deficit. But I do want to reduce the burden being paid by middle-income Americans. And and to do that, that also means I cannot reduce the burden paid by high-income Americans. So any any, uh, language to the contrary is simply not accurate. For 18 months, he's been running on this tax plan. And uh, now, five weeks before the election, Uh, He's saying that his big, bold idea is, never mind. And the fact is that if you are lowering the rates the way you described, Governor, then it is not possible to come up with enough deductions and loopholes that only affect high-income individuals to avoid either raising the deficit or burdening the middle class. It's, It's math. It's arithmetic. But domestic energy production quickly entered both candidates' speeches and their respective verbal jabs. Uh, On energy, Governor Romney and I, we both agree that we've got to uh, boost American energy production. And oil and natural gas production are uh, higher than they've been in in years. But I also believe that we've got to look at the energy sources of the future, like wind and solar and biofuels, and make those investments. Energy is critical, and the president pointed out correctly that production of oil and gas in the U.S. is up, but not due to his policies, in spite of his policies. Mr. President, all of the increase in natural gas and oil has happened on private land, not on government land. On government land, your administration has cut the number of permits and licenses in half. If I'm president, I'll double them and also get the the oil from offshore in Alaska. And I'll bring that pipeline in from Canada. And by the way, I like coal. I'm going to make sure we can continue to burn clean coal. Obama pivoted his energy discussion towards tax breaks, including those destined for oil companies. The the oil industry gets $4 billion a year in corporate welfare. Basically, they get deductions that those small businesses that Governor Romney refers to, they don't get. Now, does anybody think that ExxonMobil needs 
some extra money, when they're making money every time you go to the pump, why wouldn't we want to eliminate that? Uh, the Department of Energy has said the tax break for oil companies is $2.8 billion a year. And it's actually an accounting treatment, as you know, that's been in place for 100 years. Now, it's time to end it. And, and in one year, you provided $90 billion in breaks to the green energy world. Now, I, I like green energy as well, but that's about 50 years' worth of what oil and gas receives. And you say Exxon and Mobil. Actually, this $2.8 billion goes largely to small companies, to drilling operators and so forth. But, you know, if we get that tax rate from 35 percent down to 25 percent, why that $2.8 billion is on the table? Of course it's on the table. Still in the economy. PBS NewsHour anchor Jim Lair stayed above the fray for much of the discussion, except to move each candidate along to the next question. On that, on that point, which just is for the, these, just for the these small businesses excuse, we're talking about. Excuse me, just, uh -huh. just so everybody understands, yeah. we're way over our first 15 minutes. It's fun, isn't it? It's okay, it's great. That's great. okay. No problem. Now, you all don't, don't, have, a, you don't have a problem, I don't have a problem, because we're still on the economy. Very let's, quickly, let's get back before to we leave the economy. Let's get back to Medicare. No, the, no, the, no, the president no, said no, that no, the government can provide the service. The format left Romney and Obama to interact back and forth over the role of government. And what we're seeing right now is, in my view, a, a trickle-down government approach, which has government thinking it can do a better job than free people pursuing their dreams. And it's not working. And the proof of that is 23 million people out of work. The proof of that is one out of six people in poverty. The proof of that is we've gone from 32 million on food stamps to 47 million on food stamps. Uh, as Abraham Lincoln understood, there are also some things we do better together. So in the middle of the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln uh, said, let's help to finance the Transcontinental Railroad. Let's start the National Academy of Sciences. Let's uh, start land-grant colleges because we want to give these gateways of opportunity for all Americans because if all Americans are getting opportunity, we're all going to be better off. That doesn't restrict people's freedom. That enhances it. Political pundits and network no instant change. polls identified Romney as a clear winner in Wednesday's debate, citing a crisp performance against the president. But critics of Romney signaled his distinct move towards the political center after this past year's Republican primary. Three more debates, two presidential and one between the vice presidential candidates, will take place over the next 30 days, leaving many questions regarding the final outcome of the 2012 election until November 6th. Political rhetoric aside, America is recovering, albeit slowly, from the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. Historically, rural America lags behind more populous urban areas during recoveries, but things have been different this time. Corn and soybean prices soared to all-time highs this past summer, and despite the worst drought in 50 years, net farm income and farmland values are also expected to remain in or near record territory. This week, though, a study of business conditions in portions of the Midwest and Great Plains revealed prospects for strong economic growth, at least through the end of the year, are not so good. A leading economic indicator in middle America crept above growth neutral this week for the first time in several months, but not by much. Creighton University's Business Conditions Index registered a week 50.4 for the month of September. Anything above 50 indicates expansion. The survey spent most of the past year in the mid to upper 50s, but slipped into negative territory three months ago. The index is an average of new orders, production or sales, inventories, and employment. Economist Ernie Goss conducts the monthly survey of nine mid-American states, and he isn't optimistic about the fourth quarter, predicting virtually no economic growth. Our numbers indicate that for the fourth quarter, which of course we're moving into now, is going to be almost flat, perhaps a half a percent growth. That is nothing, nothing to write home about. This economy is moving into a recession if something's not done about those very significant tax hikes and spending cuts slated to go into effect uh, in January of 2013. According to Goss, September had the lowest employment tally in three years as the region shed jobs. The last time the index was this low on jobs, the U.S. was just beginning the long road to recovery. And Goss says the manufacturing sector, which helped lead the country back from the economic abyss, is now losing jobs. The economy, that's GDP, that's the sales, that's the market value of 
uh, goods and services, that's looking like almost flat. Then you look at job growth. Oh no, this is, we're talking about maybe losing jobs for the fourth quarter. Now we'll have to wait and see, but right now we've been almost flat uh, US-wise and in the region, the United States region, over the last two or three months. What, we're, what I'm expecting is flat for the fourth quarter, meaning no job growth for the fourth quarter of 2012. Exports have helped buoy the U.S. economy in recent months, but even that market is slowing. On the positive side of the equation, domestic energy production is bolstering the economies of North Dakota and Oklahoma. Iowa is also helping offset the big contractions in other states. While the drought of 2012 has had major implications for the state's grain and livestock producers, it has yet to slow the state's agriculture equipment manufacturers. Nevertheless, it has negatively influenced retail sales on Main Street. Anticipating slower sales in the months ahead, supply managers have trimmed inventory over the past three months. But they're not the only ones with a gloomy short-term outlook. We don't need folks who, during election time, suddenly are worrying about trade practices. If I'd known that all the upcoming elections, taken, the looming expiration of the Bush-era tax cuts, and the debt crisis in Europe are creating a perfect storm of economic uncertainty. If, if Congress and the president don't, don't get back to Washington and do something about the physical cliff, we're going to see a recession in 2013. I, I see little chance of, of avoiding a, a recession if we don't get some uh, with these numbers, which is, we're talking about a weak economy, a weak regional economy, a weak national economy, and you lay on top of that spending cuts and tax increases, that's a recipe for a recession. Next, the Market to Market Report. The Agriculture Department is scheduled to release its latest estimates on supply and demand next week. Ahead of the official guess, however, private analysts at Informa Economics predicted Friday that the USDA will raise estimates on domestic corn and soybean production. And, as you might expect, grain prices declined. For the week, December wheat lost 45 cents, while the nearby corn contract moved 8 cents lower. Soybeans also declined as the November contract settled with a weekly loss of 50 cents, while nearby meal prices declined 15.70 per ton. In the softs, cotton was one of the winners this week as the December contract gained 84 cents. In the dairy market, October Class 3 milk futures gained 21 cents, while the deferred contract moved 15 cents higher. Over in livestock, December cattle gained $1.50, nearby feeders advanced nearly $2, and the December lean hog contract rallied nearly $3. In the financials, the euro gained 166 basis points against the dollar. Crude oil lost $2.30 per barrel. Comex Gold advanced by $7 an ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index lost nearly 5 points to settle at 659.35. Here now to lend us her insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Sue Martin. Sue, welcome back. Thank you, Mike. We're glad to have you here. It's been it's been kind of a busy week. There's been some news out of China uh, that their economy might be slowing down a little bit. What effect is that having on our commodity markets? Well, China is such a, a huge player in the world market, and of course, in corn, they were they are number two producer in the world, and at one time was number two exporter, but have since you know became a major importer. So they've changed their complexion a little bit, but still. Uh, their slowing economy causes concern that you'll see crude oil prices fall, uh, less demand may be on grains uh, as food um, consumption or as people earn less, they don't eat as well. Maybe that creates a little bit of a lesser demand on grains, that type of thing. Um, but um, still, all in all, I think that uh, while their economy is forecast that it'll slow or their growth will slow to 65 to 7%, we still have to keep in mind that that economy is 1.4 million or billion people, and that's huge. And on top of it, if you go back and look before 2005 or even 2003, when they got awarded the uh, Beijing Olympics, the Summer Olympics, that's what really set them in motion for growth. Uh, they were buying everything, they needed everything. Uh, it was all about image, and they had so much work to do in those five years that it, it just set the ball rolling on commodities and raw commodities. And, it, and, and in doing so, it put people to work, 
And of course, they've also been building cities that maybe nobody lives in just yet, but with time, maybe. And, uh, you know, there is talk that, and I guess it's been approved out of Beijing, that they will start enhancing their rail system across the country. So that's going to put people to work. So, you know, I listen to people get concerned, and it's because at the height of, of going into those Beijing Olympics, their growth was up around 10 to 11 percent. But I think it's not um, feasible to really keep thinking that's what it's go always going to be. I think they're settling more into their own. Sure, and that's realistic to expect sort of a slowdown after growth like that. I think so. Has the market priced in kind of this bearish news from China, or is this something that people are going to be keeping an eye on for the, the next couple of months? Oh, they'll keep an eye on it uh, for some time to come. Um, I think that uh, because of the fact that they're going to be watching uh, meat imports, and, and there was some talk out of the finance ministry out of China that um, they were looking at adding a value-added tax or a VAT tax on beef, um, well, be on meat, pork, poultry, and eggs. And I thought that was rather interesting. And yet, when they talked about that, the hog market here didn't skip a beat. It, it just sort of ignored that. And so, and even the cattle market just kind of took it in stride and ignored it. So I think what it, that was saying was is that if, you know, they're trying to support their own industries domestically, and then if the importer seems to think he needs to import, then he's going to have to pay a little bit of a fee for that or a tax. All right, and, and our, our market wasn't phased. It's Not at all. a bridge they'll cross if that no. actually happens. Yeah. All right, now looking into the, the grain market a little bit, which is kind of a bearish week all the way around in the grain complex. Uh, starting with wheat, what, what caused our, our slide there this week? Well, I think for one thing, the wheat market is... Um, it's, it's like um, disgruntled a little bit because it's not catching the uh, export business out of the U.S. yet. And Russia also announced, their uh, ag ministry announced that they were going to release up to a million metric tons of uh, wheat into their domestic market. won't be allowed for export. But what they're trying to do is, is hold their wheat prices down. Wheat's at a four-year high domestically over in Russia, and I think that's a symptom that they're running out of wheat to export. So that was taken as negative news. And then we seen South Korea step in and they went to Brazil and bought uh, corn in place of wheat. Uh, but we're seeing some business being done in Brazil on corn because it's about $60 a metric ton cheaper than our wheat. So now with, with this, this recent slide in wheat prices, do you see this continuing? Should producers just be holding on to what, they're, what they've got if they've got any available? Do you see a bounce back in oh. the future? I do. I think that, um, you know, when you have a corn market and wheat and corn are so tied together right now as, as feed and that type of thing, I, I think that when you've got corn stepping back on a, a seasonal uh, sell-off because of hedge pressure uh, for harvest and you've got the bean meal stepping back, that type of thing, I think wheat is justified to have a pullback. We need to pace ourselves a little bit. But on the longer pull, I think that wheat still has the potential to make higher highs. I'm still friendly wheat. You look at Australia, and their crop is expected or forecast to be down sizably, somewhere around 21, 22 million metric tons. The USDA is around 26. But uh, still, um, there's expectations that that crop's not going to be the wherewithal. They're still very dry. And so that's a big player um, in Australia. It's kind of one of our major competitors right now. And we've also seen some business kind of get deferred over to uh, France. Um, Canada's the other one so that we seem to share with a little bit. But we think by November uh, that demand's going to be more uh, at our doorstep. All right. So what kind of price do you think we'll see maybe in November? Well, I think as we go down the road, I think there's a potential to see uh, wheat prices, Chicago wheat prices, cross over the $10 mark. So I would say, you know, be willing, even though eight and a half dollar wheat sounds good, I still think there's that potential that we do still push higher for a little while yet. Worth hanging on to. Yes. All right. Let's talk corn a little bit. You mentioned seasonal pressure on, on uh, the hedge, uh, hedge funds selling off. Mm -hmm. Do you see this continuing for a month or two? What's, uh, what's your timeline there for corn to... It is possible that corn's put its lows in on the surprise uh, stocks report, quarterly stocks report out of the USDA. We had gotten down just within a little bit before they uh, came out with that report that last Friday, a week ago, um, to 705. And on our wave counts, that's a wave three. 
which a lot of times can stop a market too. And of course, then the news on the USDA's estimate uh, showing, you know, ending stocks or beginning stocks, I should say, at 988 million bushels, that was like a big shock. You know, uh, less in is less out unless you're finding another way to manipulate numbers, and we expect that to occur. So um, I think that that sent the prices absolutely streaking, of course, to the upside, went limit up. Sunday night, markets were up a little bit more, but couldn't seem to race away. The market had done too much too soon. And I think that, um, you know, it's interesting because I've got data going all the way back to 1912 on corn. And um, in years similar to this one, corn, I don't think in the past, has ever put a harvest low in in September. It's always been late October at the earliest and many times early November. So this is going to be interesting to see if this one sticks. Or does the market come back with a little bit of negative news and then we start to filter back down and take a look at this again? But I think we're limited as to how low we're going. Um, you know, six and a half to seven dollar corn I think is very good and end users are certainly looking at protecting themselves. So if we, that said, I would say that I wouldn't be surprised if corn started to filter backwards a little bit here this next week maybe in front of the report, just kind of aligning itself. Still, 735 to 740 might be a, a nice spot for support. All right, and then we'll just keep an eye on uh, next week's report and That's right. get some movement there. Yes. Now, looking at soybeans, they followed corn higher last week on last Friday, and then they, they seem to have stalled a little bit. Uh, what do you see happening in soybeans? Well, the bean market is the one place that I tend to be probably the most bullish. Mm -hmm. um, you know, corn did its way four, and that was at 852, and it got to 849. That was close enough. So to me, corn really doesn't have the potential to, to really take that out by much, if it's going to at all. Uh, so that's another part of corn killing time. On beans, it, there's a difference. Now, I think part of what's going on with the bean market is, first off, bean yields seem to be a little bit better in many areas than what everybody was expecting. So that's a good, uh, good thing. The Brazilian crop, uh, the expectation of a record crop, huge plantings, record plantings. So they're talking an 81, USDA is at 81 million metric tons. Staffer C. Mercados came out at 82 million metric tons. So that's that high projection. And then, of course, Argentina is expected to plant a record crop too and then at the expense of corn and some other things. But all said, um, you know, a year ago they were looking at a record crop and it didn't happen. Who knows? Let's say it happens. Well, first off, the U.S.'s uh, export sales are already 81.7% of what the USDA has us targeted for for this crop year. And so that said is we're very front-end loaded. At some point, our export, you know, demand is going to just fall off the face of the earth. And that's going to be a bearish thing for at least a time being. Uh, what I suspect is, is that if Brazil is able to get this crop home like they hope so, and, and when it's being planted, you have to assume the best. But if they get it home like they hope so, their infrastructure isn't going to handle it real well. And they're going to have bottlenecks, probably a stevedore strike, mm -hmm. the ideal timing. And so I think what's going to happen is it's going to spread it out still and their plantings aren't getting in as early as they'd like. Uh, a year ago, they had 5% planted. They're only 3% estimated planted this week. So I think that um, we have still a longer picture taking us into February, March, maybe April. And then we'll see where we stand. But I think once we get close, the world buyer is going to start going hand to mouth and just try to work himself to where he can get to cheaper products. All right, just kind of make his way through and then see yeah. how, see what happens coming exactly. out of South America. All right, well, let's talk livestock a little bit. There's been a, a good week in both uh, cattle and hogs. What do you see happening in the feeder markets? Well, in the feeder cattle market, I think that uh, we have to uh, keep in mind, I think that our lows are in on that market for some time to come. But I also think that we've had a pretty good rally and now the market's kind of filtering down a little bit. Um, we might see the market still step back a little bit more on the feeders. Maybe Jan feeders get down to around 143, you know, something like that. Um, maybe 142. But I don't know as if they get much more than that. Lightweight feeders, 400 pounders, seem to be in good demand. And the reason being for that is because there's so much silage out there. And on top of it, they're also looking at those and thinking, boy, there's not much following them up behind them. So I think in light of all of that, you know, that's holding that market together. 
uh, corn prices, the market dropping here, very beneficial to the cattle market as well. All right. Uh, fat cattle, similar? Well, the fat market, I think uh, when I look at the cattle market, I keep thinking that the fats are going to see a little bit of a bounce here. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at October cattle, and I think in the last 30 years, the widest spread between October and June cattle has been about $6.14. And this week, it got to $7.50. So it's, it's set a new record for, for as wide as that spread should normally be or the widest it would ever be. Um, that said, it tells me that either Junes are going to fall, which I'm not sure I, I see that just yet. Um, it would tell me that the Octobers are probably going to go higher. You had the uh, packer willing to pay up this week for cattle. Even though he's cut the kill, he stepped up to the plate and paid up or he wasn't going to get them bought. So that said, basis is you have cash premium over the uh, futures right now, which is kind of what to be expected. So I think when I look at the October cattle, I think there's about another 3 $4 in it to the upside. I don't know how much more than that. Uh, Dece, if they can get the Dece cattle up around 130 that might be all you could expect there, maybe 129 something. All right. Really quick, we didn't get much of a chance. Let's talk hogs just a little bit. Where do you see going forward in hogs? Well, the hog market's been interesting. That market has been throwing some bearish news. You know, the hogs and pig report didn't show really much liquidation. The market went up. Uh, you had this announcement out of China about the VAT tax potential. Market went up. It's like it's ignoring the bearish news. And what's interesting is I think demand is pretty good for both beef and pork. In fact, Japan is back in our meat market again, so that's a good thing. But um, when you look at... Um, um, Exports on pork, I think they're starting to maybe pick up a little bit. I think domestic demand is picking up a little bit. Um, the hog market, there's an old saying, and in fact, the first time I was ever on this show, I kind of talked about that thing. Um, but uh, higher prices in September means higher prices in and December over the August time frame. Thank you so much, Sue. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But if you'd like more information from Sue on where these volatile markets just may be headed, visit the Market Plus page at our website. You'll find expanded market analysis, audio podcasts, and streaming video of our program, as well as links to our Twitter feed and Facebook account, all free at the Market to Market website. Be sure to join us next week when we'll examine the market impact of USDA's latest supply and demand estimates. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by DuPont Pioneer, working with growers to match the right product to the right acre. Science with service, delivering success.